I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, are there any more words to be said? We've had such wise words, such moving thoughts from you on the floor, from David on the platform. I feel really I should give up and just say, let's be quiet. But dear friends, you and I have been in a privileged ecumenical space these last two days. We've waited together in prayer and in Bible study. We've reflected on our ecumenical journey so far, and we've considered some new agendas for the future. We've done what John, Archbishop John Hapgood used to say. We have been eating and drinking together our way to visible unity. He always said that was such an important part of our ecumenical journey. What is it that you will take with you from our privileged time? I think I shall take two things with me. The first is a renewed conviction that our ecumenical task is not to create some great architectural construction of the church based on brilliant agreed statements or cleverly constructed ecumenical joinery. Though I'm the first to acknowledge that we do need strong doctrinal agreed statements on those issues which were causes of our division. And yes, we do need structures, but structures that liberate us and enable us. And we do need to intensify our action together for the hurting and violent world. But what I take from our time is what we most need is a renewed confidence that in spite of our ecclesial separations, we really do have a common belief in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we really do believe in that mysterious relationship of mutual giving and receiving love that binds the persons of the Trinity in one. That mutual attentiveness that conformity of mind and will that is the very life of God, so evocatively captured for us in the way that words never can capture it, in the beautiful Rublev icon of the Holy Trinity, a gift of the Russian Orthodox Church to us. That life has been poured out in love for the life of the world, in the dying of Jesus, and in that act, everything has been changed for all time, for all eternity. We all share in that life as we abide in God's love. You and I need to go on reassuring one another that in spite of our ecclesial separations, our different views of the Eucharist or ministry or primacy, or our very different responses to complex ethical issues of our day, we really do believe in the same God. And we believe that the unity of the church has absolutely everything to do with making God's own life of love visible in such a way that new possibility is seen in the way we live together for the life of the world. We are called to reveal to the world by the way we live and the way we love God's loving intention for the whole world. Remember those qualities of love we've thought of in Corinthians 13 patience, kindness, not insisting on our own way, not irritable or resentful, but enduring all things. 
They're certainly qualities that judge me. They judge our personal lives and they judge our communal lives. But these are ecumenical virtues. We can only live like that as long as we participate in the very life of the triune God. God's life is the source of all our loving attitudes and our actions and the ground of our unity. We belong together for no other reason than that we are enfolded in God's life of love, in the communion of God's love. Love binds the persons of the Trinity in one. Love binds God to us. Love binds us to God. And love binds us to one another in the love of God. It is God's life, God's life of love, that is the source of our unity. And it is that love we are called to show in the world. And that's why Archbishop Rowan keeps telling us the church and its unity have to look like God and radiate and speak of God's own life. To live apart from one another is to contradict the very nature of God's own being, to contradict love. To be visibly one is the only true, authentic, credible way to manifest God's love in a broken and hurting world. That is our ecumenical vocation. There can be no turning back. I think we've experienced something of this unity, haven't we, here in our praying together, as joined in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have stood together where Jesus stands and prayed together as Jesus prays, our Father. Prayer has to be the foundation and motivating force of all our striving for visible unity. Being together in prayer, in God's love. It's not theological discussion, not action for justice and peace, essential as these things are, that will empower our ecumenical agenda. Our primary and constantly recreating activity is prayer. Waiting on God as we've done together in silence as the Society of Friends are helping us to understand. Responding to God in joyful hymn singing as the Methodists encourage us. Pondering the word of scripture together as the Lutherans tell us. Letting the spirit fill us as the Pentecostals show us. Being led in confident extempore prayer as the black majority churches show us. Captivated as we've been this morning by the beauty and suggestiveness of the icons of the Orthodox tradition. Being together in that intimacy of communion in which words, music, art, and silence all have their place. And I don't think that we can give up on struggling to reach full Eucharistic communion. For there we mysteriously make a memorial, an anamnesis of God's supreme act of love in sending the Son and Jesus' perfect act of returning love in his self-offering to the Father for us sinners. And there we receive the benefits of his passion. It's this life, God's life of love, that we experience most profoundly and most mysteriously together in prayer that we are called to live out together with the multiplicity, the abundance of gifts of the Spirit of which we've read in Corinthians and which are then used in the service of one another, in the service of the world, the service of the whole creation. 
And there's a second thing closely linked to this that I've been convinced of in our privileged time together. Something I haven't seen in other ecumenical meetings. That's the need to develop, as we go on together, a new kind of expectation in ecumenical encounter. An expectation that when we look at one another, when we really listen to one another, when we take the effort to stand where others stand, to see things with others' eyes, we shall recognize then in one another a fidelity to the same Lord, the same gospel of salvation for all people, and the same faithful response lived out in their service and their mission. We shall recognize the same life of Christ because they, like us, are receivers of the same grace, the same love of God. So we need to be ready, as Robert Runcie used to say in our ecumenical encounters, to genuflect to others as carriers of Christ. We need an ecumenism of recognition. Wouldn't such an expectancy change us? Wouldn't the expectancy that we can recognize Christ's love in the life and witness of others change our ecumenical endeavor from that often frustrating negotiation to grace-filled encounter, an encounter of love. We shall discover that we can love one another if we are to recognize the love of Christ in the life of the other. Then we shall be prepared to stay with those tedious struggles, never saying, I have no need of you, never giving up on one another, but working through our painful differences, and they are painful, as some of us have experienced that pain here. We shall work through them, bearing each other's pain, entering each other's pain, believing that God's love will draw us together deeper and deeper into God's love. So then, let each of us go out from here, believing that the unity we are called to make visible is none other than the unity of God's own life, a life of love, self-sacrificial love. Let's go out from here, <coughs> eager to recognize Christ present in the faith, worship, sacraments, ministry, service, and mission of others. If we concentrate on recognizing Christ-likeness in one another, this will surely transform our ecumenical journey into an encounter of love, a collision of love. The ecumenical way is a sacred task of love and requires in us a holy disposition of love. I give you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Beautiful words, but of course terrifying words too, for Jesus' love for us took him on the road of suffering and to death on a cross. That is the love we're enfolded in, a love at whose heart is forever a cross. And that's the costly love we are to show forth. The God who is love requires of us love, love which is shown in a life of costly unity with one another and in costly service to the world. So let love undergird and flood our ecumenical efforts, our doctrinal conversations, our shared witness and service 
and above all, our shared prayer. If we can let this happen, then one day, maybe we shall all wake up and rub our eyes and see what God's love has already done among us and with us and in us. Unity in which diversity beyond anything we can imagine now will blossom. It will be the fruit of God's act of love, uniting us with one another in his love. What does love require of us? The God who is love requires of us love. Amen.